From the Oregon State University Extension Service, this is Pollination, a podcast that tells the stories of researchers, land managers, and concerned citizens making bold strides to improve the health of pollinators. I'm your host, Dr. Adoni Melithopoulos, Assistant Professor in Pollinator Health in the Department of Horticulture. One of my favorite times of year is mason bee season. It's with this beautiful blue metallic bee, uh, Osmia lignaria. If you're in Washington or Utah or California, is out uh, foraging. It's one of the first bees that we see. And for many of you, you've got straws or some kind of wooden block where these bees are nesting, providing not only pollination, but a lot of delight to you to watch these really gregarious um, and hardworking bees at work. Now, we've had previous episodes where we've learned there are other Osmia other than Osmia lignaria. And to help us sort this all out and get the picture of the Osmia uh, and the subgenus Osmia where uh, Osmia lignaria is classified, I reached out to Dr. Michael Branstetter, who is a research entomologist at the USDA ARS Pollinating Insects Research Unit in Logan, Utah. Now, he specializes in understanding the deep history of these bees using uh, DNA technology or, or molecular systematics. And in this episode, he's going to tell us about what he found when he looked at this group. And there's some very remarkable discoveries in terms of where this bee came from, its evolutionary history, and some important um um, important insights into the management of these bees based on their evolutionary history. So without further ado, Dr. Michael Branstetter this week on pollination. Well, welcome to pollination. I'm so glad to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. You know, I remember the first time I met you uh, was at Orchard Bee Association meeting. It was a coffee break, and you studiously got to work on some data that you were working on. And it was very complicated screen that you had in front of you. And I imagine um, this pursuit of learning the evolutionary biology of insects and bees, in this case, is a very you know specialized skill set. So to begin with, what what um, what has inspired you to spend your career working on um, these kinds of questions? Yeah, well, I mean, sort of, you know, just studying the sort of natural history of, of organisms on the planet, it, you know, is just something that has um, always been, you know, of a, a great interest of mine that just fascinated me, you know, in understanding their, their evolution. Um, and, and especially, you know, just these interesting cases of, you know, convergence, you know, or, or unexpected things, um, you know, kind of just, you know, figuring, you know, finding those things and discovering them has always just fascinated me and figuring out what you can sort of reconstruct by just looking at, you know, the species that exist today. So reconstructing, you know, maybe what happened in the past to help us explain, you know, the patterns of diversity that we see today. Um, and, you know, for a long time, you know, we just looked at, you know, you know, the, the morphology of insects, um, and, you know, both, you know, living things as well as fossils to sort of try to piece together, um, you know, sort of observe, you know, document the patterns and then try to explain, you know, those patterns. But in the last, you know, I mean, I guess 50 years, you know, we've sort of unlocked the ability to, to peek into the, the DNA, the genetic code and, and have, um, you know, a, a much greater amount of data. And that's really sort of, you know, peaked in the last 10 years where now we can get whole genomes from things. Um, so it's given us great power to sort of more, you know, more easily and more sort of confidently assess these evolutionary relationships, but also has become more challenging, you know, and that we have, you know, you know, tons more data. Um, and, and, um, and so getting that data, but then analyzing it, you know, is sort of made it so that biologists now need to have backgrounds in genomics and bioinformatics um, and, and computing. Um, and so, you know, when you watched me on my computer, it's often what I'm doing in my, you know, if I have little breaks here and there, but it's just remote remoting into a computer server somewhere and running the next analysis for, for some new set of, of things. Cause each analysis often takes, takes a while to run. And so you just keep, keep plugging away. Um, 
but I can I can only imagine, and I guess today I'm I'm excited to sort of carry that theme forward because we're going to be talking about a bee that everybody's familiar with. But I have a feeling that as we peel back the layers of its evolutionary history, it gets stranger and weirder. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, well, there's the genus Osmia that everybody knows. There's Osmia lignaria, uh, and in the east, people uh, working with Osmia cornifrons, um, and so I think most people are you know, surprised to learn that there's more than one species of Osmia. Can you give us a broad overview of the bees in the genus Osmia, and in particular, this subgenus of Osmia that seems to be so important? Uh, where are they located in the world? And tell us a little bit about the group. Yeah, I might start just a step back, you know, just to say, I mean, bees, of course, there's 20,000 species, you know, globally. And so those of us that work on sort of bee diversity generally, always like to mention that point. Um, because a lot of people, you know, they sort of, you know, simplify, you know, or think, you know, just the thing of just the honeybee, or maybe now that at least Osmia is becoming better known, there's, there's just the, you know, the one mason bee species, but the reality is there's, you know, thousands and thousands of species, you know, many more, um, that, most of them, which we don't know very much about. Um, but, you know, so there's, you know, of that larger diversity, um, you know, they're separated into um, a number of, of families of bees. And so Osmia belong to the family Megachylidae. Um, and this is a group that includes one of the larger families, just 4,000, over 4,000 species. And a lot of things I'm saying, going to say about Osmia, um, even the subgenus, you know, a lot of these things sort of apply to, to the whole family. You know, there's some, some similar characteristics. Um, but the, um, you know, the, the genus Osmia, um, you know, includes about 350 species uh, globally. Um, and it's more or less split evenly between uh, North America and um, Europe and, and Asia, um, while there's a few more species um, in um, in the Eastern Hemisphere, um, but they're all sort of mostly sol- they're all solitary species, um, so they're not social like the honeybee. Um, and one of the characteristics that's come is they they nest in sort of pre-made cavities. So a lot of solitary bees are ground nesting bees, but Osmia and most megachylid bees. Um, nest in these pre-made cavities, you know, in, in burrows, um, either, you know, from the beetles have made in wood or stems or in crevices under rocks. Or one of the cooler kind of more interesting ones is, is there are a few species that nest in, in snail shells even um, where they, you know, they go in and, and close off the entrance. Um, and their, their actual nest cells and often the, the entrance, um, they cover with something, either mud or, or chewed leaf material. And it's really that use of mud that they've gotten, you know, their common name, uh, one of their common names, you know, are the, the mason bees, you know, so they're you know, doing masonry to, to create their, their nest cavity. Um, but, you know, there's this, you know, you know, a very, you know, large number of species in this group that have a, you know, amazing, you know, diversity of, of um, sort of life histories and, and, um, and different behaviors and sorts of things. So it's, it's a cool group of bees to study. Um, and so the subgenus Osmia, you know, is just one kind of subgroup within this, this larger genus, you know, that, and it shares some of the, you know, some characteristics with the larger group, but, you know, certainly has um, some of its own peculiarities. Um, but so the subgenus, you know, is quite a bit smaller. There's uh, 29 species currently known are described and a number of subspecies. So those are sort of less, you know, sort of a formal you know, um, sort of, um, you know, sort of group, you know, sort of class of, of, of you know, sort of below this, this sort of, you know, group of organism below the species that sort of just generally demarcates something that looks slightly different, but probably is of the same species. Um, and within that diversity, um, there's definitely, uh, it's definitely lopsided in terms of where they occur. So, you know, um, I mean, one thing I think is always really important for people to understand is, you know, any species you're talking about, you know, generally doesn't occur everywhere. You know, there's a there's the native distribution, and then sometimes it occurs outside of that because it's been you know introduced there. Um, and so this is one of the issues actually within this group because they're useful in pollination and have been you know developed as managed pollinators. People have started sort of moving them around to see if they're useful in other areas. Um, but so the sort of North America um, only has two. Uh, native species of of the Osmia um, Osmia so subgenus. Ju- so just two of the twenty nine are in North America. That's right. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So they're really really 
that that lopsidedness. There's a, a whole lot of them in Europe and Asia. You only have a okay. Well, wow, that's amazing. Yep. So, and, and actually, so that, and, um, and this is an interesting pattern in North America in general, thinking of the whole genus Osmia, most of the species are in Western North America. Um, and so there's only, you know, you know, a few species, um, I think 27 or so in, in Eastern North America. And that pattern is, uh, sort of mimicked here where there's two species of Osmia Osmia. They occur in Western, the two both occur in Western North America. Um, but only one of them, and it's just one of the subspecies of the species, occurs in, in eastern North America. It tends to be less abundant there. Um, so, so there's two in the west, one in the east, and then all the rest of the diversity is in um, in what we call the old world, which is you know Europe, Asia, um, Eurasia. So the two the Arctic. The two species that we would find here in the west is Osmia lignaria. What's the second species? Yeah, that's Osmia ribiflorus. Um, so Osmia lignaria is the you know blue orchard bee, and then ribiflorus is sometimes called the the blueberry bee. That's right. I, I, was, I remember hearing Jim Kane speak about it being uh, in some places really dependent on manzanitas and uh, plants in the mm-hmm. Arcaceae. Okay. All right. Exactly. Okay. So the other thing that I've often been told about this group is that they're very hard for taxonomists to identify and separate um can you just walk us through why that is and and uh, how this has kind of been an obstacle to under maybe understanding these evolutionary relationships yeah um i mean you know, the 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 job of of systematists or taxonomists you know is trying to figure out you know uh, what the different species are and then how to tell them apart um and you know we do this by you know um you know, collecting samples in the field, um, putting a pin through them, you know, we call mounting them and then looking at them with a, you know, high magnification, uh, microscope. Um, and you know, the reality with any, with most insects, you know, is that they're, they're quite small, um, you know, and, and I mean, bees tend to be, you know, larger than some, but the, you know, the, you know, the features we look at are all, you know, really tiny. And so it's, 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 I guess for starters, it's often very difficult you know, just using your eye in the field, you know, to be able to, to tell what the species are, you know, so if, especially when there are, you know, tens or hundreds of species and they're all closely related. And so that usually means they tend to look more alike, uh, yeah. you know, finding those characters that differentiate them um, is challenging. And, you know, I'm, you know, this, this question of like, you know, Osmia being harder than other groups, you know, I mean, that there is this, you know, just, you know, for, feature that some, some genera, um, you know, you know, tend to just be more challenging, you know, where the characters and what that usually means is that the characters are, you know, less obvious, more subtle, um, maybe smaller, um, um, you know, or sometimes, um, you know, there's variation that's just hard to deal with, you know, where, you know, I think, you know, one problem that, that non, you know, that, that this sort of just doesn't always come across to folks that aren't trained is that, you know, they think that a species is going to be very, you know, um, um, static, you know, that you look at individuals everywhere and they're all going to look the same. But the reality is there's not, you know, nature is very messy. There's a lot of variation. And it's, and usually, you know, when you see that a species has a really wide distribution, very often across that distribution, you know, they look different, you know. So sometimes the character that maybe defines that species, maybe in some places it's really really clear you know it's like there's a horn on the you know the the face that's really distinct but then you look at you know another location or even individuals within the same location and sometimes it's less distinct um and so that's i think one of the issues with osmia is just the combination of you know the closely related species have very you know um you know the the characters that differentiate them are are you know um are, are challenging to 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 see um and to describe you know easily um but then those things tend to vary within species um, and so it takes a lot of time of looking at a lot of specimens to really understand, you know, what those special characters are that differentiate them and then how, um, um, you know, how they vary, you know, within each species. And I think on top of that, you know, males and females, you know, differ morphologically. Um, and sometimes it's easy to tell the females apart, but it's really hard to tell uh, the males apart. Right. And, and you don't um, catch a, a family of them. You catch them one at a time. So. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you're, you're, it's rare to say collect, you know, a mating pair together. Um, and so usually you're sort of 
collecting in an area and you're lucky if you get both a male and a female at the same time. And then you still have to sort of, you know, make a guess, you know, there are, are these male and female, you know, specimens, the same species or not. Um, and usually you're sort of doing that initially with morphology and making a guess, but what's kind of fun is now with molecular data, we can, we can often confirm, you know, that, that they're the same, um, by sequencing the DNA and, and, and seeing that they match, um, well, it does strike me, just to pick up on that theme, that um, you mentioned earlier that uh, in some ways the bee world, the native bee world, was one of the first adopters for molecular technologies. And I've always, you know, run into it in terms of um, uh, barcoding. So it's barcoding this mitochondrial uh, gene. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us about the techniques you used here and, you know, um, um, some of the limitations of using that barcoding. Yeah. Um, so as I already sort of mentioned earlier, I mean, one of the breakthroughs in the last five, 10 years has been the ability to sequence, you know, not only a single gene um, in, the, in the case of the barcode gene, it's one mitochondrial gene. Um, but now we can sequence, you know, the whole genome or at least sort of what we call genome scale data, which is getting sort of, you know, a bunch of genes across the genome, but not necessarily the whole genome. And, and that's sort of the, the dominant method right now is the sort of, you know, getting most, you know, a big part of the genome, but not the whole genome. And the reason we um, sort of are, are, are say not just doing the whole genome is it's all about, you know, the, you know, um, the costs involved. And so, the, you know, the, the more you sequence, the more it costs per specimen. And so if you can do, you know, get enough data um, for less money, um, than doing a whole genome, then you can do many more individuals. And so this particular method that we use in this paper um, is one of these approaches where you are getting, you're able to get, you know, several thousand sort of genes, um, in this case, not the mitochondrial genome, but across the nuclear genome. And you can do that for much less money. So you can sequence a specimen, you get these, you know, several thousand genes for about $30 to $40 a specimen versus for a genome, it's still the costs are around, you know, a couple thousand dollars um, per specimen. Um, Wait a sec. The barcode, let, let me get this oh. straight. So this, uh, you just, you just said, like, if you were going to sequence the whole thing, this one specimen, you'd be putting $3,000 down on the table, which would make uh, many people cry. But you're saying that this technique where you're kind of like skipping through and picking little parts can be like $30. So way, way cheaper. Is that, did I get that right? Exactly. That's ah, correct. I'll be darned. Okay. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the things that, you know, we sort of keep, keep an eye on, it, you know, are these technologies and, and, and how they're changing because it probably will be five, 10 years and you can do whole genomes for, for $30, you know, and, and, um, and, you know, there are some ways to do that already, although the quality isn't quite as good, um, so, you know, things are just changing so fast that it'll be very soon that that's what that's what we're doing. Oh, I um, guess the, in contrast, we were, we were talking about this real standard way that has been become standard practice. This mitochondrial, that's a lot cheaper than thirty dollars. That's right. Yeah. So it's um, it's I mean, it's actually not much cheaper, which is why oh. you know, our, our lab has been, you know, sort of doing this, you know, this kind of genome scale approach. Um but 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 even but people are starting to come up with new methods that they're they're making that barcode approach you know even cheaper. So probably you know just a few years ago you know doing the barcode gene would cost you five to ten dollars depending on how many samples you're trying to do all at once. Um, but there are newer methods now, um, even using these handheld DNA sequencers, where you can potentially get that barcode gene for less than a dollar a sample um, using some sort of clever simplification. I just got to stop you there. Handheld. What do you mean, handheld? Like like a phone? Yeah. Um, really? Yeah, pretty much smaller than a phone, even. Um, God. I mean, you know, you you definitely need some equipment, and you need, um, you know, some technology in addition to the sequencer to make it all work. Okay, all right. Pretty much with a few lab items, um, a laptop, and and the sequencer, you know, which which really is, you know, it's it's about the size of a, a cell phone. Um, you can you can generate this this data now. So there's a company, Oxford Nanopore Technologies, that makes this device called the the Minion, um, that is 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 very is it's very quickly um, sort of being developed and 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 improved so that you can you know generate um, sequence data 
you know, and you're at your house or, you know, in, in a very small lab um, for, for less money, including you know, from barcode genes to whole genomes. Um, and that's a technology that's, you know, has the potential to really revolutionize, you know, um, you know, sort of quick and cheap, you know, sequencing and identification of species. Okay. So let me recap this. We've got a group of bees that's been traditionally, you know, just by luck and circumstance, they're just hard to tell apart. So there's a kind of ambiguity into sort of how they're related because you can't even, it may be in some cases, resolve some of the species apart. It looks so similar. And so along mm -hmm. comes this technology and now it's getting cheaper and cheaper. And so finally, a point in history has arrived where you can actually kind of separate these species up like uh, you couldn't before. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things I, I guess I was going to comment, I mean, so the barcoding approach I mean, it's one gene. It's been, you know, because it's cheap and, um, you know, it's it sort of was adopted as sort of potential, you know, one marker that could um, potentially separate and identify species for not a lot of, of, of money. And it's fast evolving, you know, so there's so for even, I mean, so like, you know, genes evolve at different rates and, you know, you know closely related species um, you know, tend to have, um, you know, not have diverged that long ago. And so you need something oh, that yeah. evolves faster so that it can actually differentiate, you know, very recent, you know, events, um, in evolutionary time. And so the barcode gene has sort of you know, generally been a pretty good marker for animals to, to separate species, but actually because it's a single gene and it's fast evolving, um, it's pretty good at, you know, species differentiation, but it doesn't work as well at sort of, you know, you know, confidently, you know, resolving, you know, deeper splits, you know, so you might be able to say, well, these two closely related species, you know, this, this barcode gene says, yeah, they are closely related, but you go back a little farther in time, you know, and have more distantly related species. And then that one gene sort of doesn't work as well, where there's just, uh, you know, you have one nucleotide, you know, within the gene that's sort of multiple times, you know, has, has evolved, you know, the same base pair. And so you start getting this noise that, that, um, that just confounds whatever signal there is to reconstruct it. And that's where having more, more genetic data, you know, can be really helpful. And so they, this, might, they might be going at different rates. I mean, I, I'm picturing a deck of cards that yeah. when you're, you have two decks of cards and you've been shuffling them, but if you had, if they were all being shuffled at the same rate, it gets to, you can't tell these different branches apart, but if you had some of that were slow and some that were fast or something, you could start to get into these deeper histories. Yep, exactly. Ah. Yeah. So, so that's, what's really great about these, you know, these approaches that give you this genome scale data is you can have, you know, you know, some of those genes will be slow and they're going to resolve those really ancient, you know, you know, um, um, divergences, you know, with a lot of confidence. And then you'll have these fast ones that are, are better at these very recent ones. And so this approach that we use, what's great about it is it gives you sort of resolution at all these different scales, you know, from millions, you know, from tens, to even hundreds of millions of years ago to um, very recent in time uh, from, you know, potentially even, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. And so it does it you know, simultaneously, whereas the barcode gene has a little bit more restricted use. And there's more and more evidence, you know, even saying that even at that really shallow scale where the barcode gene has generally been really good, there are some cases there where even it doesn't perform well but these larger data sets, uh, you know, these methods that give you more data actually do. Um, and so it costs a little bit more, but you, you actually get more from it. Um, and so that's why, you know, I, I tended to use that approach. However, because of, you know, the fact that you can maybe start doing, you know, barcodes for less than a dollar, um, you know, and it works in a lot of cases, at least for, for identifying species or, or differentiating them, um, it still is a popular method to, to use. Okay, I think that sets us up really well, and that, that is the best explanation of this field that I've ever had, and I'm, I hope the <laughs> listeners have appreciated that we've uh, kind of like dove quite deep in, but at least it sets it up and allows us to discuss um, your research. Let's take a quick break, and let's come back, and I want to get into, into the mystery of the subgenus Osmia and its evolutionary history. And so we've got um, we've got the techniques down there. These really uh, wonderful techniques for resolving and 
uh, different species out. And, and you also mentioned kind of like diving back into history and being able to resolve um, deeper histories. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about some of the relationships between the species in the subgenus Osmia that you found and what were some of the kind of like broad themes that came out in your analysis? Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things, you know, so this isn't the first study to, to sort of look at phylogenetic relationships, but it's the most comprehensive in terms of the number of species that have been included um, and in terms, of course, the just the number of genetic loci. But from the previous study, you know, there were there were a few relationships that were really interesting, but weren't you know super well supported by the data. And so we really wanted to try to resolve uh, resolve those things. And so I wanted to start by just you know, commenting on, you know, to me, what you know, to the most one of the most important things was was resolving, you know, the position in the phylogeny of the two um, North American species, you know, Lignaria and Ribofloris. And the reason is, I mean, partly just this interesting question, right? Like, you know, are these two species that geographically co-occur, you know, are they, you know, closely related to one another, or or are they not? And, oh, you know, and when would, they're not, it would stand to reason that they might be, but <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yep, exactly. I mean, you might, you know, the, the, the morphology, you know, the had, you know, certainly suggested that they were, they were quite, you know, they're quite different, but you never know, um, you know, things can you know, really come, you know, surprise you. Um, but you know, often, you know, I mean, you know, one, you know, null hypothesis is, you know, that, that things sort out, you know, geographically. Um, and so that was one of the things we kind of wanted to test. And so the previous study had sort of found this pattern that they that the two North American species, you know, weren't closely related, you know, within the group. And that actually this but the the the, the species that is sort of the the sister or the outlier, you know, you know, um, you know, separate from all the others was one of the North American species, the blueberry bee, Osmia ribofloris. Um, but that result hadn't been you know very strongly supported. And so in our um analysis with this bigger data set, we actually confirm that result with, with really high support. You know, so analyzing the data a lot of different ways, we always get that, that relationship. So this blueberry bee, Osmia ribofloris, which is sort of an outlier from all the other species, um, is, you know, sort of the sis, what we call the sister group, you, you know, sort of, um, you know, to all the rest of the species. And that just means that all the rest of the species are more closely related to another than to, um, than to Osmia ribofloris. Um, but we found sort of broadly, you know, there are these four groups, you know, that, um, and again, this was sort of, you know, suggested in the other study and we sort of are confirming it. Um, but it's, you know, we're always, you know, systematists, you know, we're trying to, to, to classify diversity and make it easier to, um, you know, sort of communicate about it. Um, and, and, the, you know, to talk about, you know, so you can communicate, you know, these relationship, you know, sorts of things that we find. And so, you know, you know, you often get these phylogenies, you know, you see how things are related. And then you, you try to look for some morphological, you know, or some kind of correlates, you know, that, that makes sense. And so with this phylogeny, um, we've been able to find these four groups, you know, that we sort of have named by one of the species in that group. And so there's the ribofloris group, which is right now just one species, but potentially more. Um, there's the apicata group, which is sort of a, med a Mediterranean group of, of four species. Um, the emarginata group, which is slightly larger and sort of includes sort of things in the Mediterranean uh, region and Europe. And then there's this much, the largest group, which is called the, the bicornus group or clade um, that, that includes actually all of the agriculturally um, important species. And each of these groups, I mean, with the exception of ribofloris, you know, has some morphological characters that can sort of help differentiate it. And so the two characters that have been sort of found, you know, is really the, the combination of whether it has these horns on, on the head or the, the sort of clypeus, which is kind of like the upper lip. Um, and then also the the length of the mouth parts, whether they're they're long or short. And so depending on the combination of those two things, you can you can sort the species into these these groups. And so the bicornis clade, you know, one of the you know, it's like like bicornis is like two two um, two horns essentially. And you know, one of the characteristics of this group, you know, is that a lot of the species, you know, most of them have have these protruding horns on on the clypeus. Um, it can be a very sort of striking um, feature. Um, and so it's in that group, like I said, where we all of the agriculturally important species belong. And, and it's where the Osmia lignaria, the blue orchard bee, belongs. So what's kind of cool within that group is that the blue orchard bee, you know, the other one, the, the other species that's North American, um, is sister to all the other ones, um, which of course occur in, in, in Europe and Asia. 
And so you sort of see this repeated pattern. So Lignaria and Riboflorus are not close relatives. So they're, they're separated. Um, and then you, but you have them sort of being both being sort of the sister species to, you know, um, these larger, you know, sort of, you know, um, important um, um, groups. But what it suggests, you know, even without sort of a, a more rigorous analysis that we did do in this paper, but it sort of immediately suggests that, you know, that there's been movement between the continents, you know, and sort of a more complicated evolutionary history, um, you know, over, over time, you know, with things moving around, speciating, um, and moving back. Well, I was, I was thinking, how is it possible to have, you know, we have these two species in, uh, in North America and they are kind of on opposite ends of the family tree. I, I guess that, it would suggest that there was, you know, whoever came over here to begin with, there was, you know, there was a more diversity or there's, there's a lot of, you know, species that no longer exist. Is that what it means that, you know, and Lignaria is the lineage of that one. And um, yeah. Is there any other explanation for why, how you could have only two species here and them being on really opposite ends of the tree? Yeah. Well, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, um, you know, we often do kind of uh, asymmetric, you know, topologies, you know, where they have these two sister groups and, and one has a lot of species and one has few. Um, I mean, it's, it's it's a pattern you see all over, you know, uh, the tree of life. It's one that sort of really intrigued, you know, um, systematists and biologists for a long time and trying to explain those disparities. And I think, you know, the, the reality is that it's um, you know, there's no one explanation, you know, you know, the, the history, um, you know, um, you know, it can be, you know, random and, and stochastic. And so, you know, it could just be, um, you know, kind of a combination of, of just, you know, that maybe there were more in you know, more species in North America and, and they, for whatever reason, happened to go extinct. Um, or it's just for whatever reason, they haven't differentiated, you know, they haven't, the, 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 whatever allowed them to become more diverse. Um, in the, in another in the other region in this case in, you know, in Europe and Asia it just those conditions didn't didn't exist here um, and so I mean you know what we see in the group overall kind of the deeper level is it seems like you know the you know the Palearctic or the you know Europe and Asia you know has been sort of a center of diversity for for osmiaean bees um, and so it just seems like it's an area where they've been around longer so time might be an explanation. And for whatever reason, they've done well at, at, at diversifying there. Um, and, and, but they've, you know, occasionally crossed over into North America. And at least in this case, they just have never, they've never, you know, they've, they've clearly kept a presence, but they haven't really diversified, you know, the, you know, either because of extinction or just lack of, you know, speciation. Um, okay. That, that, kind of, yeah, go ahead. I've got another question after that. Uh, yeah, this is kind of a random, you know, thought that I actually just just popped in my brain right now. But you know, so these, you know, this group, right, is you know they become you know managed pollinate pollinators of of orchard crops, um, you know, including in in apple orchards, um, and you know, similarly, you know, like just think about the apple, you know, it's thought actually it originated, you know, in I think Kazakhstan region, uh, so the Palearctic. Yeah, so you see this kind of parallel thing even where. You know, there's maybe you know several groups, and even you know these these you know plants and, and the bees in case that are interacting, you know, maybe have similar patterns of originating in in the Palearctic, you know, coming into the you know Nearctic, um, but but you know because they're sort of newer arrivals, you know, maybe not you know not diversifying as much. And maybe Lignaria remembers its uh, tree fruit roots. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess the other thing is I'm looking at these, you know, there's a really nice figure where, where the family tree is laid out and it almost looks and the way, and the way that you describe it is riboflorus, this blueberry bee is really, um, you know, um, kind of the only uh, seemingly only kind of, uh, descendant. I think this is what you were saying earlier, that when you look at this, uh, bicornus, group there's just a lot of diversity but this one little arm that seems to be the orphan arm of the subgenus osmi only has one species that i guess that's maybe what you were saying that in europe either time or conditions or whatever has led to uh radiation but it's not like the riboflorus arm radiated in in the americas even though it seems like it's been here that long yeah yep yeah, that's huh. that's exactly right um and it's just it's hard to know why um 
it does seem like, you know, we have, I mean, it's, it's clearly not, you know, at least morphologically, there's, there's clearly not as differentiated as much. Um, there is some evidence that, that there may be more than one species, you know, maybe as many as three or four. And we're sort of actually working on that as from a new project. But even with that sort of, you know, you know, um, potential added diversity, it still isn't, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's still quite asymmetric in terms of, you know, one group and the other. It's just hard to know, you know, I mean, I, you know, within, you know, over the last 12 million years that, you know, this group has seemingly existed, um, you know, um, climates and habitats have, have changed a lot. Um, and um, for whatever reason, they've, they've just, they've done better um, evolutionarily in, in the old world. I, I imagine that is one of the things um, that you always are guarding yourself against. There's the just so story of evolution where, you know, you can explain things retrospectively, but not really because there's so much missing and you really only have these fragments of the past that you to analyze their DNA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes there's very clear correlations, you know, where some group in some area just radiates and then you can you can say, you know, in, in this group, you know, it evolved this trait, you know, maybe now it's it's pollinating this flower or it's nesting in this habitat or in this this type of, um, you know, micro, you know, kind of habitat. And it's clear that that, you know, that is what maybe has allowed it to be more successful. Um, but in a lot of cases, you know, we just don't know. And it could just be just, you know, you know, I mean, there's always a, a, a part of it is always randomness. Um, well, I guess one question I have, I was reading in the paper that uh, one of we, we had Kate Mc, uh, McCroy on just a, uh, a bunch of episodes ago telling us about uh, Osmia Taurus is a, you know, potentially, um, you know, very good. It really likes to be in Maryland. <laughs> it seems to be doing very well out there and a species that we mm-hmm. really keeping our eye on uh, as an exotic. And the one thing I noticed was, um, first of all, I guess one thing that's concerning is that you know, that one group um, where Lignaria is has a whole lot of um, there's a whole lot of diversity, but it's not in North America. So there's the potential for competition between related groups maybe is, um, you know, quite a quite a concern. But I suppose the other thing is I remember reading that the Osmia Taurus um, was also there was a lot of variation within it. You were talking about this earlier, how you have a species and it has a large range and it can look quite variable. I wanted to hear you speak just about some of these exotic Osmia. I know the Logan Bee Lab has been really working on developing tools for identifying these, uh, but also just maybe specifically with Osmia Taurus and its sort of variability in appearance. Yeah. um, I mean, just the whole issue of non-native species, you know, you know, coming in, uh, getting established, and then potentially competing with native species, you know, is, is, you know, just an issue of, of, of major concern. Um, in some ways it's been less of an issue, um, maybe in, in bees, just because we don't have, you know, a lot of evidence of, of there being, you know, major, um, you know, problems, you know, of, of either, you know, I don't know, killing a tree species or oh, yeah. becoming a, a, a pest in certain crops, um, I mean, bees are ten, you know, generally, you know, pollinators. And, and so what's interesting about this group in particular is because they've become, you know, um, I mean, so what's really important about them, you know, agriculturally is, you know, you know, there are these number of species that have been, become developed as managed pollinators, you know, sort of a solitary bee managed pollinator that can be used as an alternative or in, you know, conjunction with, with the honeybee, um, which is a social species. Um, and so our, you know, uh, you know, USDA lab has really been, you know, kind of one of the, you know, the first labs to, to develop, you know, these solitary bees for, for pollination purposes. And so Osmia lignaria has become one of the major ones. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, our lab has, has studied them for, for a while. Um, but there's, you know, a number of species within, within this group, you know, you know, in, 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 um, in Asia and Europe and in the U S the people have identified, you know, have, you know, attributes that make them, you know, maybe easier to be used in managed pollination. As a consequence of that, you know, initially before people were as concerned about non-native species, you know, they said, oh, well, this one seemed to be working really well, you know, in Spain, um, you know, Osmia, um, you know, Cornuda, you know, Cornifrons, um, let's bring it, 
over into the U.S. and, you know, see if we can use these same methods and have it pollinate here. And so actually some of the species in this group were intentionally introduced. So Osmia cornifrons, which is actually native to Asia, was intentionally in, in, introduced um, into the U.S., you know, for pollination to see if it could be used um, to improve, you know, um, agricultural output. Um, and so at the time that seemed fine. Um, but, but now as we're, you know, you know, looking closer sometimes at interactions, we see that it's not always necessarily you know, good. And so certainly with things like bumblebees, people are more and more concerned about, you know, pests and pathogens coming in with these other species. And then those maybe getting out into um, other native species and that potentially having negative effects. So in general, you know, we don't, we don't, you know, I mean, I think, you know, documenting those potential negative effects is still sort of ongoing. Um, yeah. And, you know, there hasn't been a lot of real clear examples. And so, um, you know, I feel like it's it's not, you know, the non-native, the non-native bee issue has not been as, as great of a, an issue as it has been, you know, in some other groups. Um, but there's this one case of Osmia taurus. So the taurus was um, thought to be accidentally introduced um, potentially with um, with cornifrons. Um, and so both of those species are now established um, in the east. And I think cornifrons maybe also is, is found in, in the west now. Um, but so there's new research kind of finding that there is some competition between these introduced species and the native species. And so I know, you know, uh, Kate LaCroix had been has been working on sort of the effects potentially of Taurus on um, native Osmia species in the east and finding some, you know, some negative interactions. Um, and one of the ones that have been sort of thought of people we commented on for a while is so Osmia lignaria, you know, there's two subspecies, one in the west, one in the east. And people have been kind of noticing a decline in sort of abundance of the eastern one. And so it's been people have wondered if maybe that's because of these introduced species. Um, and I think there's some evidence now that that could be the case with with Osmia taurus. Um, and so there's a lot of you know, just I mean, so there's, you know, you know, I guess what people are really interested to see, you know, is there competition, you know, is there some negative effect of these you know, introduced species? And of course, we want to, you know, if we know what all the species are, we want to keep an eye, you know, out to, to look for them, because if they are introduced, you know, it's, it's better to, you know, I mean, we really want to try to avoid these kind of accidental introductions in case there are unintended consequences. Um, but now, in terms of my research, you know, we were, I mean, it's part of one of the reasons we wanted to, you know, generate this molecular phylogeny and resolve these relationships, better understand the systematics is because these species are being introduced is we want to, you know, know as much as we can about them. And so in addition to making this, this kind of well-resolved, you know, species level of phylogeny, we also pulled out this barcoding gene from our data, um, kind of a neat trick that you can do. And then we combined it with this data and this larger database of barcode sequences. We just asked the question, you know, are, you know, are all these, you know, these things, these you know, sequences that we're calling this species, you know, are they all clustering together or not? And one of the things we found with Taurus is that they're actually, those sequences sort of form a, a group of, of the, that include three named species, Osmia rufina, obvious, Osmia taurus, um, and Osmia rufinoides, um, that potentially suggests um, that, that they're, they're all one species. Um, and, and this is sort of ongoing research that we want to get more samples on. Um, but, but actually if, if they were all one species, um, the oldest name in the group is Osmia rufina. And so if we were to, you know, do what's called sort of synonymize the names into one name, Osmia taurus would become Osmia rufina. Oh. It would mean that this thing that people have been studying you know, Taurus as this introduced species in the U.S. actually would not be called Taurus anymore. And okay, so that's where there's so the let, communication. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. So that's just to repeat that. So really, people have yeah. been identifying that have these three have kind of characterized these three species. But when you go through and do the genetic work, I was looking at the the figure here. They may have diverged only a million years ago, so they're you know very close. And so there may be justification. Uh, for reclassifying them to the most ancestral arm, which would be Rafina. And um, okay, th- did I get that all right? Mostly, yeah. Okay. I mean, the the just I guess one comment would be, you know, in terms of which name would be, you know, would sort of subsume them all. Um, you know, taxonomists use what's called the principle of, of priority, which is part of the you know the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. So it's not it's actually not a result based on the phylogeny here. It's all based on the fact that that name was described first in the literature. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> okay. of the names that are available to be used, you know, if you're going to 
merge them all into one species, you pick the oldest available name. That makes um, sense because the person case, who, who came up with Rafina, they were actually right. So we will we'll reward them with the name. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but I just I'll say this is all pre, you know, somewhat preliminary because you know the, the mitochondrial data that we have is sort of suggesting this. Um, but it's you know there there have been cases where where clearly the this mitochondrial gene just doesn't do a good job separating species. And so one of the things we're trying to do now is sequence a few more individuals with this genome scale data. And to get a little bit broader sampling of individuals, both in the introduced range and in the native range, and see if we can, you know, can resolve this confidently. Well, that's really interesting. So the in addition to being able to resolve the history of this fascinating group of bees, I guess by knowing, you know, some of this information can then be used to sort of perhaps suggest, well, these three groups, you know, this 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 species, there's some evidence of it being, you know doing very, very well in, in a new location. Maybe these other other groups, we should keep an eye on them because they're closely related. I suppose it has, it'll, it gives us some predictive power, although you, you never really know until, um, but it, I, I suppose those are some of the, or I guess for economically important species, they may kind of be real clo- closely related. There might be something about that evolutionary history that predisposes them to being managed or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, that, yeah, you know, I, well, I, that was a bit of a stretch, I suppose. Would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms of just as you making these phylogenies, you know, it's like, what's the point? And I mean, it's it's a structure for, you know, for for it's a sort of predictive framework, really. You know, I mean, the general you know hypothesis is that if two things are closely related, you expect them to share, you know, more features with one another than something else that's more distantly related. Um, I mean, you know, like I said, I mean, nature is messy and, and things can surprise you. But but in general, you know, that's that sort of pattern holds true. And so, yeah, if you had one species that was really great at management, you know, but for whatever reason, it's in decline or it's gone extinct. You know, like, oh, man, like we don't have our pollinator anymore. What species might we look at, you know, to replace it? You know, yeah, a good, a really good um, you know, strategy would probably be to, to look at the phylogeny and pick, you know, look at the species that are closely related and study their biology, you know, and see if they have the same attributes that made, you know, the other species um, good at pollinating. And and that's why, I mean, really, you know, we see that in this clade already, you know, within the bicornis clade, there's at least five species that people have developed for managed pollination. Um and they do differ, you know, from species to species, but at the same time, you know, they're they're showing themselves to be you know, you know, good at, good at this, you know, good in, in these managed settings. Well, this was great. Uh, fascinating. Um, I am, uh, I really, it's expanded my uh, appreciation of this, uh, of this group. Well, anyway, so we really appreciate you taking the time, but we but we'll hold on just a second. We have one last segment. We'd like to ask you a couple of uh, questions that are unrelated to all of this uh, book recommendation and, uh, Go to tool. So um, we'll just uh, grab, well, let's take a quick break and we'll come right back. Okay, we are back. So do you have a book recommendation for our listeners? Yeah, I uh, recommend, partly because I'm reading through it myself right now in more detail, but there's a wonderful book. Uh, called The Solitary Bees, Biology, Evolution, and Con- Conservation, um, edited, or sorry, not edited, but sort of written by Brian Danforth, Robert Minkley, and, and John Neff. Um, and maybe others have already recommended this book, but it's just, you know, it's just a fantastic book, you know, focusing on the non-social species uh, of bees and why they're important as pollinators um, but, but also just about all the quirky, cool things that, that bees do biologically. Um, and it's really up to date with the latest literature. Um, it's a great, great resource. It's a really great book. And we, we do have an episode with, uh, Dr. Danforth when, uh, talking about the book when it came out. But the one thing I was going to say is John Neff is going to be our, our, our speaker at the Oregon Bee Atlas Conference. I'm really looking forward to, uh, hearing him talk about all the work that he does in Texas. Awesome. Okay, so that's a great book suggestion. You're doing good. Yeah, let's see how you do on the next one. <laughs> do, you, right. do you have a, um, a, a go-to tool for the kind of work you do? And just I 
can't imagine what that's going to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, the go-to tool. Um, well, um, I, I would have to say the Illumina uh, HiSeq DNA sequencer is is the go to tool these days for generating these you know these uh, you know, genome scale data sets. Is it the size um, of a an oven or a shoebox or what does this thing look like? Yeah, it's I would say an oven is a, is a is a good um, probably a, yeah a, a good. It has a very similar shape and size for sure. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I guess you, you, we were talking about this at the break. You, you often you go into the collection and you'll take a B leg off and you'll take the DNA off. And what, it, what goes into the oven? What's the. Yeah. Well, Sam, I mean, you know, it, it would be a sad world. I mean, most of what we work with is these little vials of little clear, you know, of clear liquid. You know, we just pipette them back and forth between, you know, two, you know, little snap cap tubes, you know, adding, you know, little ingredients here and there, you know, kind of like a witch does. And in the end, you, you know, you, you, you get this purified DNA um, that's often, you know, just, you know, 10 microliters, you know, oh. an extremely small amount of, of liquid of material that goes in the oven, you know, and, and out you get, you know, these gigabases of, of DNA sequence data. Um, and so most of my world is often, you know, is that, um, but, but it does start thankfully, you know, with a specimen that we've collected in the field and, and put in the collection um, by making that you know, sometimes, yeah, just you lose that link sometimes between the specimen and, and the molecular world. Although it must be, you know, this is the place uh, North America to do this work with such such a great collection uh, located in Logan that's been well curated and uh, must be make your job a lot easier to be able to open up a drawer and know you have authoritative determinations on specimens and you can work from there. Definitely, and this is a fantastic place to be. And uh, you know, I mentioned this to you earlier um, before the, the the beginning of the podcast. But my background is in is in ants, and so I'm still learning a lot about you know, bee diversity and taxonomy. But you know, we have this collection with over 1.5 million specimens that several people, but most recently Terry Griswold, has really built up to what it is. Um, and and you know, we've you know both collected a lot ourselves, but also um, you know, um, acquired, you know, material from others. And we still would like to acquire more to really be, you know, an epicenter for, for, for B systematics research. And the reality is, I mean, for identifying things, you know, even with a, a good key, a morphological key, it's still often hard to use those without a, a, a reference collection, a specimen to look at. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things that's, that's really wonderful here, especially for the Western U.S., you know, we probably have, you know, the best collection of, of identified bees um, of anywhere. Well, th being that the case, that brings us to our last question. <laughs> of all those little bees, is there anyone that sort of uh, particularly you have a fondness for? And it's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, it's such a tough question to answer. I, you know, I definitely don't want to just say Osmia because that's what we were just talking about for an hour. But, you know, honestly, I, I'm a, a sort of tropical biologist at, at heart. And so while I love, you know, all the diversity, um, you know, and, and the species in, in the in the temperate zone, um, I love going to the tropics and seeing stingless bees. Um, so people know these are social bees, um, but they don't sting, uh, as their name suggests. Um, but they're really cool because they're very diverse in the in the you know South America and Central America, as well as in um, um, Southeast Asia and Africa. Um, and there's a bunch of species, they all have really cool biologies and they make honey. And one of the things I learned recently is, you know, there's people that work in both, you know, sort of Australia and in South America that, you know, study the different honey making species and they and even try to, you know, cultivate them to make you know, different kinds of honey and to use them in pollination, um, and sort of for tropical fruits. Um, and it's just a fascinating sort of group of bees, um, and, um, an area of research. That I sort of am jealous sometimes of, of the people that get to to live and and work on these bees. You know, I I I completely agree. I did see someone I w was in Mexico, but we have an episode with um, uh, Dr. Mike Burgett, and he um, 
unfortunately with the pandemic, he he was all, he goes to Thailand every winter and he studies stingless bees and uh, apis species, and he um, is uh, moping here in Corvallis until uh, travel restrictions <laughs> are lifted. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. This is a great, uh, I'm, I'm glad to finally have some of these techniques clear my mind, but I'm also fascinated to hear about this, um, the, this really rich history in the subgenus Osmia. You're welcome. It's great to be here. I appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you about our research and happy to come back anytime. Thank you so much for listening. The show is produced by Quinn, Sin, and Neil, who's a student here at OSU in the New Media Communications Program. And the show wouldn't even be possible without the support of the Oregon Legislature, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, and Western SARE. Show notes with links mentioned on each episode are available on the website, which is at pollinationpodcast.oregonstate.edu. I also love hearing from you, and there's several ways to connect with me. The first one is you can visit the website and leave an episode-specific comment. You can suggest a future guest or topic or ask a question that could be featured in a future episode. But you can do the same things on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by visiting the Oregon Bee Project. Thanks so much for listening, and see you next week.